Happy August. Have we survived the summer and the Delta variant of COVID? I don't know about you guys, but I'm over it. You want to know what I'm also over? I'm over women being told that they must have a C-section if they have a breech presenting baby. So instead of just being angry about it, I decided to do something about it. Today's interview is with Breach Without Borders. And we are talking about the safety of breech birthing. Enjoy. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Okay, before we get started, I have a couple of reminders. The first, if you are pregnant and you are seeking more information, I have a ton of free guides for you at birthstory.com. Click on the tab, the workbook. All you have to do is put your email address in and you have access to my whole library. These are all of the documents that I share with my private doula clients. So if you're interested in learning more about delayed cord clamping, cord blood banking, placenta encapsulation, what the epidural procedure is like, download all my free guides at birthstory.com. While you're there, I would love for you to pick up a copy of the Birth Story Pregnancy Guidebook. It's a 42-week, week-by-week guide to your pregnancy. It has 42 journaling prompts. Lots of birth affirmations, 42 birth stories, and it tells you everything that's going on inside of you from your baby's perspective. You can get $5 off and free shipping and a free gift by using code birth story podcast when you check out. Last but not least, if you are a fan of this podcast, then I just ask that you push pause and leave me a five-star review. I don't know how all the algorithms work, but I know that the reviews help other parents find their way to my podcast. I appreciate you. I appreciate you listening, and I would really appreciate a review. Thanks, and enjoy this episode. Dr. Freeze and Dr. Hayes, welcome to the Birth Story Podcast. Thank you for being here and for representing what you do with Breach Without Borders. Dr. Freeze, let's start with you. Can you tell us where you're at in the world and a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. I'm in France right now. I have a little bit of a crazy life where we travel back and forth between France and the U.S., mostly half and half, but I'm in France for the next 18 months because we have a sabbatical year. And I'm a PhD academic researcher. And before I started specializing in breach, I was focusing a lot on research in home birth, midwives, unassisted birth. That was kind of my world before I entered breach. I should also add that I had four babies all at home. So that's kind of my backstory. We won't have time to share my birth stories today, but I have quite a few of them behind my belt at this point. The first one was a planned unassisted birth, actually. And the last three were had mid- midwives, but they were very hands-off. I just told them, I'm going to do the whole birth myself. You're just there in case an emergency comes up. And they said, great, that's my favorite kind of birth. So I'm like, great, just leave me alone. Excellent. I, I <laughs> love it. My- I'll have to have you back on, Dr. Freeze, just for your birth story. Yeah, sure. I think that would be amazing. We've had a couple of unassisted birth stories that we've shared on the Birth Story podcast, and they are highly listened to because they're just really empowering. 
So, yeah. So I have four kids. I, I used to say I have four little kids, but sadly, I don't think I can say that that much. My youngest just turned eight and my oldest is 14. It's been really difficult seeing my kids grow up. I mean, it's exciting and it's fun, but for me, it's really, really sad at the same time because I love the newborn stage so much. And so much of my identity for so long has been wrapped up in being a young mother or a mother of young children. You know, it's strange to find myself entering a new phase of life. And I keep wanting to deny, to deny that it's happening. <laughs> so yeah, I'm having a little bit of a midlife crisis of sorts, accepting the fact that my children are getting older and that I'm done with the early mothering and moving on to a new stage. I can feel that and relate to it. I'm in my mid forties now and much of my, my whole identity is been around pregnancy, birth, doulas, mm -hmm. babies. And now I was an older mom, but mine are five and six getting ready to be six and seven and both going off to kindergarten. And it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to accept that the baby toddler phase and child rearing phase is over for me too. So we should write the next book on letting go, letting go of the baby phase. So Dr. Hayes, could you share with us where you're at in the world and a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, I am currently in Asheville, North Carolina, and I was uh, actually born in Brevard, not very far from Asheville. And this has sort of been home to me, but I've also lived and worked pretty much all over the world. And I'm getting ready to make another exit and moving to Guatemala. So I am an obstetrician. I have both an academic medical center and home birth background. I have worked overseas with Doctors Without Borders in numerous settings. So yeah, I have done birth in just about every setting you can imagine. And what is your favorite? Oh, absolutely. Home birth is my favorite. In general, hospitals are, and I know all the arguments for being in the hospital versus not being in the hospital, but in general, hospitals are systems that have to work. And in order to work, they have standardized procedures and rules and regulations and which require that their patients fit into their program in order to function. And birth just doesn't work that way. It is it is an individualized thing, and it it is best left alone or at, at at a minimum supported and not controlled. Thank you for that perspective. I share that perspective with you. I'm sure Dr. Freeze does up there as well, based on your birth stories. One of the things that is quite frustrating as a birth doula that I say all of the time is that I wish that advocacy wasn't a part of my job. In home birth, it's not a part of my job. It is only a part of my job when I am birthing with clients outside of their home. And so my training as a birth doula is on physical and emotional, spiritual, loving support, but it has evolved into an advocacy role. And um, I just don't think that those two things should be going hand in hand. But nonetheless, they do. So being a doula now represents many different hats, including advocacy, unfortunately, in the hospital. Well, what we're here to talk about today is breach birthing. And I'm so excited. So Dr. Freeze and Dr. Hayes have founded Breach Without Borders. So can you share a little bit, either of you or both of you, about Breach Without Borders? Yeah, sure. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit. And we are dedicated to breach training, breach education, and breach advocacy. So we try to reach out to both providers in that we give vaginal breach workshops. We train providers around the world. We educate providers and parents. And we also work on advocacy, trying to advocate for vaginal breach as an option. Since for most American women and many women around the world, it simply is not an option anymore. They've been basically um, forced to not use their vagina for their own birth. <laughs> Yeah. So we're really trying to make it known that it can be a safe option that you can learn how to do this appropriately. And it, it should be an option, at least for everybody who's having a baby, rather than having people being forced into having surgery. 
So we got started in 2018 as an organization, and then Dr. Hayes and I started teaching together once in late 2018, but we really started full force and full time in mid to late 2019. So it's been pretty recent since we've been going as an organization. Yeah. David, do you want to share anything else about Breach Without Borders? It's a cause that very much speaks to me. And I I got into medicine because I didn't like a lot of things about my experiences with it prior to becoming a doctor. And nothing about my training or experience changed that. My approach has always been there's a lot that's wrong here that needs to be done better. And I naively thought I could do it. (laughs) (laughs) Don't stop fighting, though. (laughs) I was like, keep fighting. There's a lot of us that are like right back behind you that are fighting on the front lines right with you in different cities all over the world, too. Let's talk a little bit about breach and what happened, right? So... In your opinions, what do you think has happened to birth in our hospital systems that is allowing policies at hospitals to say, oh, your baby's breech, we have to do an external version. If it fails, cesarean section. Could you share with us why you believe that that seems to be policy that's coming from the top down? Good question. I think that, I mean, the hospitals and the people that, determine the protocols and determine the training for obstetricians in this country like to promote the view that that it is based on evidence that it is based specifically on the term breach trial and the fact of the matter is breach birth has never been particularly popular in this country there has been as the technical parts of doing C-sections became safer. That is, they learned how to use antibiotics and control bleeding, control infection. It became a more popular option for everything. And breech birth was no different. Only about 4% of babies are present breech at term. So there are fewer opportunities to train. And so well before the term breach trial came out in 2000, many, if not most, hospitals and residency programs had stopped teaching and performing breach birth, vaginal breach birth. It just, the study itself, rather than being evidence which drove the change, was in fact designed to support the policies they were already adopting. That's where we were. I mean, I was a residency in 2000 when it came out. I found people to teach me breech birth because it was still possible, but it was not common and certainly not universal. That makes sense. So number one, lack of education and training. Is it fair to say then that most of, like say most of my clients and most of my listeners, providers, just aren't trained on how to safely deliver their baby breech if they present breech. That's absolutely true. They might have gotten a little training on doing a breech second twin extraction, but even that is, you know, maybe, maybe not, depending on where they came from. So the majority of providers simply have very little, if any, training experience. So of course, at that point, in some ways, you can't blame them because all they know what to do safely is a C-section. On the other hand, it's kind of ridiculous that something that's so common, 3 or 4% of all births and more if they're preterm, that they have no idea what to do. They have no skills other than cesarean section. Leaves them in a really bad spot because some babies can't be born by cesarean section. They're coming out too fast. And then what do you do? You know, this leads to a really bad setup. You know, a provider who's panicky, who's inexperienced, who's probably going to make something worse because they don't really know what to do. Yeah, but it's safe to say most providers really don't have the training and the experience. And since they know how to do a cesarean, they've done so many of them, they're just going to keep doing the cesarean and they're not going to be very motivated to seek out training unless they're one of those very unusual people who feels called to 
supporting maternal autonomy and called to to being a open-minded provider who's willing to continually educate and learn and to be humble enough to know that they might need to change their practice. Those are very well said statements, Dr. Freeze. And so that's where your organization comes in for some of these trainings. And I want to get there for any of the midwives, obstetricians, residents that are doulas even that are listening to this podcast today, like that they're is an organization that's supporting breach birth that wants to train you if this is a skill that you are interested in helping with that maternal autonomy, right? And respecting and supporting women Mm -hmm. in their bodies and respecting and supporting the womb space and really the baby's choice too of how they're deciding to position and be born. Before we dig a little bit deeper into your trainings, Can we back up and do a little bit of education on breach presentation in case some of our audience, I'm sure everyone's heard the term breach, but if some of my audience is like, I just need to know a little bit more. And there are several different breach presentations. So if um, Dr. Freeze or Dr. Hayes, if one of you could take that question and just do some education for my audience around, you know, what a breach presentation means. Breach means the baby's coming butt first or feet first, otherwise known as um, it's the opposite of cephalic or vertex. That's what typically comes first is the head. So it simply means the baby's turned around the other way and is coming head up and bum or feet down. And there's several kinds of breach presentations. The funny thing is, if you get into the weeds of the research, you realize that the way we label breaches, you know, what we call them is not consistent at all. But Basically, if we're going to really simplify it for parents, babies are usually frank breech, basically folded up in half with their butt first and their legs straight up by their head. And babies are flexible. They can do this. They fold flat in half (laughs) and out they come. About two thirds of breeches are frank breech. It's the most common. And the rest of breeches are essentially at term with a normal size baby. They're just kind of all scrunched up in there. In some form of tailor sitting, cross-legged sitting, the legs, if they're not frank, then they're scrunched up near the bottom. So they might be sitting on top of their legs with their feet kind of underneath the butt. They might be sitting cross-legged. And there's a lot of misconceptions actually about the safety of different kinds of breech presentations. For example, if you look in almost any obstetric textbook or guideline, they're all going to say footling breeches should never be born vaginally. It's a contraindication. That's a medical term, meaning don't do it. But when you actually look at the literature and the research and all the best studies coming out of European centers that do a lot of breaches, it actually turns out for term breaches, especially the kind of breach is irrelevant to outcomes. It doesn't make any difference whether the baby is frank or complete or incomplete or what in America we call footling, which is actually not really a footling for the most part. Outcomes are the same. And the only difference you might see is a little bit higher rate of cesarean section in labor because you have a little bit higher rate of cord prolapse if the baby is not frank. But the cord prolapses that happen with babies that are not frank actually are not very dangerous, typically. So what we can say from the best research is that if your baby's term, it really doesn't matter what the legs they're doing. There's no evidence that any position of the legs is more dangerous. But that is totally not what the obstetric literature and what the obstetric guidelines say. And so there's a real gap between the best evidence and what all the textbook and the guidelines say, because there's all this tradition that's gotten passed down that's taken the weight of authority simply by being passed down through generations and generations of textbooks. So that's the really short version of a very long amount of research I've done and a a longish lecture that's available on our website. But it really doesn't matter if if your provider is experienced and knows what they're doing the legs can do whatever they want and that baby will generally just come out just fine. Mm-hmm. David, do you want to add anything? I think you covered it pretty well. I would just, the only thing I would add to that is that if you look back far enough through the literature, you'll find that once upon a time, complete breaches were thought to be the easiest and safest and frank breaches were the ones that they avoided. So without a lot of evidence Either way, over the history, that that has just become an attitude that became the common wisdom just switched from one to the other for for no apparent reason. 
as a clinician who's been doing breach, I, I can tell you my personal opinion is that actually complete breaches deliver easier and faster in general than frank breaches. And, you know, we can speculate about why that is the case, but that, that's my, my clinical experience with them. What I want my audience to hear from you guys, which I think is coming through loud and clear, is that if you are approaching term and your baby is breech, I need you to take a deep breath and know that there are some things to do, including delivering your baby breech by finding a supportive provider. While we've talked about those providers are few and far between organizations like Breach Without Borders or an organization like Breach Without Borders is doing training right now and actively finding individuals. So like here I am in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it just happens to be a coincidence that Dr. Hayes is in Asheville, North Carolina. I had no idea. But that means anyone that I'm connected to can, prior to Dr. Hayes moving to Guatemala, can, can help us connect to a breach friendly provider. So Anyone that reaches out to the local midwives, the local doulas should be able to help find you a provider that would be amenable to a safe breach birth. It may not be in the hospital, but it's really important. I had a prenatal this morning and the mom is 32 weeks. So early. First time mom. Mm -hmm. You know, but they love to do ultrasound. All the time, like every third visit, they love to do an ultrasound, especially when my moms are advanced maternal age. And I'm finding over and over again, as I keep getting these calls at 30, 31, 32, 33 weeks from my moms, and they're like, the baby's breech. And I'm like, no, your baby may be breech this moment, but your baby is still figuring out how they'd like to be today. And so I was hoping that Dr. Hayes, I'm going to give you this one to take. If you could talk about when babies typically make their turn to be head down. You know, I know the answer to this, but I want to hear from you and your professional opinion as an obstetrician. And if you could just maybe speak into these moms that are 32, 33 weeks long and their babies today in an ultrasound are head up to give them a little bit of advice? Sure. I think the first thing I would say is that you know, ultrasound is, is an excellent tool when it's, when it's used for something that it's actually indicated for, but we do way too many of them. It is, as a screening tool, it is a horrendously bad tool because it has lots and lots and lots of false positives and things that don't point toward any kind of pathology. This is on the doctors. I mean, this is, we have this tool and we feel like we know something because we're looking at it on a screen that we don't really know. So... I think the over part of the problem that you're talking about is that there's a serious overuse, not inconsequentially, also an overbilling for ultrasounds. The second thing that I would say is that at 31, 32, 33 weeks, I, the chances of your baby remaining breach at term are really small still. They go up by week as you go further, but I've had. I cannot tell you how many babies, how many moms I've had come to me at 39 weeks, at 40 weeks, and with breech babies that ended up being at 41 weeks or 42 weeks head down. Yep. So yes, the, late, the farther along you are in your pregnancy, the more likely your breech baby will remain breech. But they do turn all the way through the end of pregnancy and sometimes even during labor. I have had babies flip the other way during labor. And in my scenario, again, in the hospital with providers who are not educated on breech births, that ends in a cesarean section. And it's mm -hmm. devastating. Can you share a little bit about when maybe the reasons why 
like the shape of the uterus or anything like in your knowledge is there th- are there things that we know about the womb and the baby and the cord that would promote a baby being breech I'm going to say I don't really think so okay we say a lot of things about oh the shape of your uterus or the shape of your pelvis or your muscle tone and tension in various muscles. And maybe there is something there, maybe there's not. I've just not, in spite of the fact that I, or maybe because of the fact that I am something of a heretic against the system, my approach is extremely, extremely evidence-based. And if I don't see literature that tells me, gives me an explanation that I can buy and be comfortable with, based on the literature, based on the research that's done, then I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm not inclined to want to speculate about that. That was what I was hoping that you would say, Dr. Hayes, <laughs> because what I want my audience to hear is like, close your ears if you are early on, as in not in labor, and your baby is breech. Mm-hmm. And don't let the system infect you with something that tells you that there's something wrong with your body that's causing your baby yeah. to be breech. Right. It's simply not true. It doesn't make sense because you'll hear over and over again, one was breech, the next one was not breech, right? The next three were not breech. So I was sort of hoping that was your answer, <laughs> Dr. Hayes, yeah. because that's something that I definitely like try to preach in my practice is patience, that the baby's innate wisdom will guide them what way they need to be born. And that might be breach and it might be head down. We don't know. This leads me to my next question. I ended up writing a guide called how to flip a breach baby, right? Like we can, let's have a giggle, right? There was a need for it. I was getting these questions over and over and over again. And so I thought, okay, let me just put my thoughts down on all the little things that we say may promote your baby, you know, like the flashlight trick and all these things. So can we talk about some of those things? And I would love to also hear your opinion on whether to do any of them, some of them, none of them, or just let your baby be. I can talk from having had one of my babies breached for a couple of weeks during pregnancy. And, you know, as both of you are saying, I would tell women not to worry about it. And I'm going, yeah, I would say that too. Yet I still worried about it. Knowing all this stuff, it was surprising to me how stressful it was. And I was somebody who had a lot of knowledge about breach, I had a midwife who was very supportive, who, who the two of us had put together breach trainings and breach workshops. She absolutely said, I will not abandon you. We will find a way, you know, we will do this. Don't worry. And I was surprised at how much I still stressed about it and was trying to get my baby to move and that I was seeing it as a problem to solve. And so I guess I want to say I totally empathize with all the people who are trying to solve the problem because I've been, I've been there, even though it was just for a few weeks and, you know, he just turned on his own when he was ready. I mean, I should have just not even paid any attention to it, but yet I did. So it's, it's human, right? So I guess I want to reinforce the advice that, that David gave. Don't worry about it. And th- that you tell your clients. I was talking to a Maori student midwife when we were teaching in New Zealand in 2019. And she was telling me about the way that the Maori people, at least with, within her community, have seen breach. And they don't see breach as a problem, especially in the past when they had a little more options for giving birth vaginally. They understood breech babies to be special, that being breech was a sign of a of a natural leader, of a baby that was more connected to the divine, a baby that was doing things differently, and that was something to be honored. And I was a little bit blown away by how amazing it was to see reframing this thing that we saw we see as a problem to solve. Something that's wrong with the baby and we need to turn it, or there's so much stress and anxiety. You know, we're communicating to the baby non-verbally, you're doing something wrong. We need to fix you. You know, you're dangerous, you're bad, you're the wrong way, you're destroying my birth plans. And I get how stressful that is for the parents. But just to think, you know, we don't have to be like this. Our culture could 
be doing something totally differently and we could be celebrating the, these breech babies and just seeing it as the most wonderful thing that they're choosing to do this. So I would hope that we remain open-minded and realize that the idea that we're even concerned about breech babies at all is a cultural thing, which means it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't. And I look back at like what drove what drove me to even write a guide labeled how to flip a breech baby, right? <laughs> And it's going back to exactly what you're saying. Women, my clients are coming to me with anxiety, wanting to be proactive. And they're coming to me with anxiety because of the messages that they're hearing. And the messages that they've been hearing are, my baby is not safe. I'm not safe if I'm going to have to have a major abdominal surgery. So they're hearing messages that there isn't an, an alternative, that this is a blessing. This could be something good. This is the position of a natural leader. This is something to be celebrated. And my provider is educated to support me through the delivery of my baby, no matter what presentation. Since those messages aren't getting ringing in our society loud and clear, we do things like talking about going to the chiropractor, getting acupuncture, putting moxibustion on your toes, spinning your baby with all these different positions, doing an external version. I mean, there's a, doing the flashlight, putting cold compresses. I mean, there's like a million things out there. I, you know, I don't know if any of them work at all. I have no, you know, no idea because I think these, most of the babies just, like you said, Dr. Hayes, they just take their time and they eventually make their way head down unless they're that 4% that like you said, Dr. Freeze are the special ones. So anyway, I'll just laugh a little bit with you guys about this guide. If anybody wants it, sure, download it. But the point of today's episode is to try to create a different message, right? To share the good news of breach birth and that we're trying to fix something in our system that is broken, just like vaginal birth after cesarean, mm -hmm. right? Once wildly unpopular against policy. The message was that it was not safe. Your uterus was going to rupture. Everyone was going to die. And now, depending on where you live, at least where I live, if you are coming into the hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina, if you're coming into the hospital with a cesarean section, you are now encouraged to have a vaginal birth after your cesarean. We know it's safe. And so it just takes time, but I think it just takes a lot of noise, right? A lot of Dr. Freezes, a lot of Dr. Hayes, a lot of birth podcasts, a lot of doulas, a lot of midwives making noise about, come to me, I'm educated, I can help you, I know how to keep you and your baby safe, let's do this. So can you tell me a little bit about your trainings? Who's your ideal target audience? Where in the world are you conducting these? And how we could get, you know, there are some obstetricians and midwives everywhere that have a problem with the current system and have a problem with their lack of education and training and they want to learn. And maybe they're afraid to speak up, but maybe they found their way to this podcast today. So let's share with them a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, so we have intensive vaginal breach workshops that we teach. Right now, because of COVID, we've innovated and come up with a new way of teaching because so much of what we do is hands-on, in person, and we couldn't do it the same way as we did before. So right now we have what's called a hybrid workshop where you take the lectures with an online breach training course called Breach Pro. It's fully downloadable, self-paced. You get all the materials for a full year. So you can take your time working through the lectures and the didactic information. And then you schedule an in-person hands-on training. We hold these all over the United States. Well, all over the world once we can travel again. But for right now, we're mostly in the U.S. due to travel restrictions. So then you come for your simulation training. And this is in-person, but it's in very small groups, four people or less with full COVID precautions. And you get to practice on our Sophie and her mom simulators. These are these amazing lifelike obstetric simulators where you get to practice breech birth. You get to see the normal, the abnormal. You get to practice and practice all of the maneuvers. And because we're committed to 
physiological breach birth. We've engineered our simulators so you can turn them right side up because they're made to be on their backs, as is every simulator on the market. Unfortunately, that's not the way our bodies were engineered to give birth, which is in some kind of an upright, more physiologically appropriate position. So we flipped these sofis over. Um, we built a little table and some clever stirrups to hold them upright. And so you get to practice breech birth with the mom in any position. She can be upright, she can be supine, and we'll teach you maneuvers for all of the possible positions a mom might be in. So for providers who have been trained in breech birth, most likely they've been trained in just supine breech where the mom's on her back and they have a couple maneuvers that they do and that's all kind of they're comfortable with. And that's another issue is you might have somebody who's breech trained, but they've only ever done it with the mom on her back because they only know a few different maneuvers. And so they're kind of stuck into doing it that way. And the mom might not want it. I mean, I could not for the life of me lie down. I'm sorry. that I don't even know how you could during labor. And so we give you all of the tools. You can do breech birth upside down. You can do breech birth standing, squatting, kneeling, lying down. We don't care. Once you take our training, you are trained to do it however the mom is comfortable because you can adapt yourself because you've learned every, every maneuver in any possible position. So you come from your hands-on simulation training. It's two hours long in groups of four or fewer. You can add extra hours if you like. And then our training continues after you've even taken the workshop. You have a full year of live sessions that, you can, that you're subscribed to automatically as part of our training. We hold them twice a month. We also have recordings of them if you can't come live. So you get a lot of ongoing mentorship. We can talk through births that you've seen. We can watch videos together. We can even watch you practice maneuvers if you want to on your video camera and give you suggestions. And then as an organization, we provide a lot of ongoing support outside of the workshop. You can schedule peer review hours with us. We can, we're happy to meet with you and with your clients if you want to talk through things and have some informational sessions. We're working on getting labor support set up once David gets down to Guatemala and gets his licensure all ironed out. And we have in the past done some labor support with, with people we've trained, but we want to be able to offer it in a more formal fashion once everything gets figured out with licensure. We're here to support you in any way we can. If you're a parent, we're here to give you information and reassurance. If you're a provider, we're here to help you get all the knowledge and all the training you need. That's our entire goal is to give you so many more skills than you've ever had. There's a real stigma about breech birth, and a lot of providers are so scared of it that they won't even come to learn, or they're so scared about getting in trouble for wanting to learn because there's a lot of negative peer pressure and administrator pressure. To me, as an academic, it's really shocking. You know, the whole goal of my profession is to be open to learning and to always be researching, to always revising what I know. And I'm sometimes, frankly, a little shocked that medical professionals are so unwilling to learn what to me seems like an essential skill because three to 4% of the time you might need it. So if you're listening to this and you're a healthcare professional, I would really encourage you to consider coming to our, one of our trainings. You can judge if you think it's useful. I think you come away feeling like it was valuable and worth your time. And I would say, be brave. You know, um, don't be scared about speaking up with your peers and your administrators that you need to have these skills. Maybe not everybody's going to want to offer planned vaginal breech birth, but if only from a perspective of wanting to support maternal autonomy, that means you have to have breech skills. Because if you don't, you're forcing a cesarean on somebody. And that's actually both non-ethical and illegal to force somebody to have surgery that's against their consent. For a whole host of reasons, I would encourage providers to come trained and to gain extra knowledge. Why would you not want to have more skills and more knowledge in your pocket? Whoa, amazing story, right? I was just jumping in to interrupt really quick with a couple of reminders. Again, you can pick up all my free guides at birthstory.com. You can get $5 off the birth story book by using Birth Story Podcast. When you check out, that also gives you free shipping and a free gift. If you are loving this episode, I say you start at the beginning. Start on episode one and go on a journey with me, letting me be your virtual doula and guiding you through this pregnancy. And if you are loving the podcast, I ask that you share it and leave a five-star review 
on whatever podcast player you are using. Today, I celebrate you. So now let's get back to this episode. Right. I agree because your doula may show up at the door with her breach client coming and there's no reversing it. So you better know what to do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, you better know what to do. I have a question for you about ECVs, which I, you know, I know that we've kind of talked about philosophy behind them. Do you feel that there is a place or a role for an ECV at 39 or 40 weeks? Or are you both adamantly against that? So I offer and do ECVs. And the reason I offer and do ECVs is because access to to experience vaginal reach birth attendance is rarely, if ever, available. So if someone sends me someone who is breech and you know this is this is a woman who has a provider that she's planned to you know birth with and in a place where she's planned to be and it's quite a shock to the system to come to have to go someplace else meet somebody new have them as your provider for their for your birth which may or may not occur in the same city or state where you are located to start with. So I feel like offering ECV to these people is beneficial because it's reassuring. It puts them back in a a known comfort zone for them. I have about an 80% success rate in good candidates. So I've never had a complication from an ECV in my life. Having said that, I don't do them the way that it somehow in the past 20 years has become the norm to do them. I don't do them in hospitals. I don't do them with epidural anesthesia. I don't do them with, you know, uterotonic drugs, which make moms have anxiety attacks anyway. So I think there's a role in the, in the current context where there are not providers available. Mm-hmm. Having said that, if there is a, and the research is, is pretty clear, if there is a breach, bri- a breach birth provider available, having an ECV does not increase one's chances of having a vaginal birth. And that's an important thing to understand. Thank you for that perspective. Another thing I just wanted to address on this podcast is our multiples. I recently attended a birth, a twin birth in December at the hospital, and I was sick that they brought her to the operating room to deliver and i had to advocate to get her out of that operating room so fast you wouldn't even believe it so i mean thankfully she had hired a doula we labored beautifully unmedicated really undisturbed for the majority of her labor just because i wouldn't let anybody get near her and then we pushed as long as and I would have kept pushing, but I, we we were pushing and pushing and pushing until finally the private provider is like, all right, we need to go to the operating room. And I'm like, operating room? <laughs> like, lack of education by this obstetrician meant that this mom had to leave her birth environment, go push her first child out in the operating room in the off chance that baby B was breech flip breach and ne- and needed, let's air quote, needed to be mm-hmm. born via cesarean section. So I just want to put that out there. Like if you are pregnant with multiples and you are having a vaginal birth, it is really important that you provide and inf- get informed decision making. And then you can practice what I call informed refusal. Right. Thank you for suggesting and recommending that I push my baby A out in your operating room and give me my waiver. I decline. Right. Because what I watched yeah. happen was the baby was not breach. It shut everything down as soon as baby A was born. Baby B was not born for another four hours. Why? Because the mom was in an operating room. Yeah, and, it's the world's biggest vote of no confidence. Right. You know, how hard is, I mean, how hard is it to wheel somebody down if they really need surgery? It's not really that hard. But yeah, otherwise you're basically saying we expect you to fail. 
heartbreaking. We have on those messages as humans, we so strongly, right? Yeah, and then they get shared like wildfire. Mm-hmm. So then the the next mom, you know, goes into a Facebook group or something with moms of multiples. And these are the messages that they receive over and over again. So the message we're trying to share today is you have choice. You can exercise informed refusal and you can absolutely find a provider that will support you if you're 40, 41 weeks and your baby has decided to stay head up, (laughs) you know, with a beautiful breech vaginal birth. So I would say that it's not necessarily the obstetrician's choice to take her to the operating room. I think every hospital that I'm aware of in the United States practices what they call a double setup twin delivery. And that is taking you into the operating room with it all set up for a surgical birth in case it's needed. But I think that is probably not necessarily the fault of whoever the obstetrician was. That is almost certainly hospital protocol that the obstetrician doesn't have a voice in. So I wonder if it would be useful to ask if you're expecting twins and you have this discussion with your provider, just ask outright like, hey, is this a hospital policy thing that I'm supposed to be in the OR because I don't want to be there? Or, you know, is this coming from you or is this really coming from administration? And just ask them right out, right? Like, who's making this rule in the first place? Yeah. And I think that what I've learned over and over again about like hospital policies, this is really important for my audience, is you have every right to say no to every single one of their policies. I have clients that go into the hospital and literally will say, I am here, I am paying. I will let you know if I need you. We are not going to monitor this baby. You're not going to take a temperature. You're not going to do a blood pressure. I will sign every form that I need to sign waiving liability and against medical recommendation or AMA, against medical advice. I have moms that we come and they are five, six centimeters. We thought they were a little bit further along than they are. Baby's a negative two station. And they're like, oh, I'm going back home, you know? And the hospital's Mm -hmm. like, well, it's against our policy to let you leave. It's very important. There is a form, an AMA form, and you can say against medical advice, thank you, no continuous monitoring. Thank you, no IV port. Thank you, no OR delivery in case maybe B is breached. So it is important to know what these hospital policies are. Hire a doula. They'll tell you if you're birthing at a hospital, but you can speak out against them. But if you are comfortable and open to home birth, there are a lot of home birth providers that right now, today, are excited to help you and support you with a breach presentation and not try to disturb that process. Dr. Freeze, you and Dr. Hayes are both very committed to evidence-based practices. And so I was hoping that we could close the podcast with just a little bit more on the safety of breech birth. So first off, let's talk about term singleton babies. So one baby, more or less full grown. The evidence is pretty clear that vaginal breech birth is a reasonably safe choice. If you look at the short term outcomes, so, you know, first couple weeks of life, The evidence either shows that it's just as safe if you're coming from countries and systems where vaginal breech birth is done regularly, or it might have a slightly elevated rate of perinatal mortality, but very, very small compared to planned cesarean at 39 weeks. Part of that comes because if you have a planned C-section at 39 weeks, you automatically cut off a lot of the adverse events that might happen the last few weeks of pregnancy. You can't have a stillbirth if you've already had your baby, right? So part of it's not just that it's breached, part of it's just that it's bypassing labor and bypassing pregnancy. But we're finding that it's, even in the short term, the outcomes are very, very close together, if not identical. And some of the very best research coming out of countries, Finland, Norway, France, Belgium, shows that it's just as safe, even in the short term for the baby, which is what everybody tends to be concerned about, right? That's what we usually talk about. When we say, is it safe? The implication means, is it safe for the baby right now? 
But of course, safety isn't just about short-term neonatal outcomes, right? A, the baby grows up and has a life and has health problems. The mom probably will have more babies. Many mothers do. The mom has the rest of her reproductive future to think about her own health. And what we find is while planned cesarean section might have a tiny little advantage in the short term for the baby, for breach, might not, but might, that advantage pretty much disappears when you look at long-term outcomes, both for the baby and for the mother, for sure. For the mother, vaginal birth is vastly safer. So that's the really short version of a very long amount of research as well, as far as the safety of vaginal breech birth. The thing is what most obstetricians and even many midwives are taught is that vaginal breech birth is extremely dangerous. And I can't get into all the reasons why here, because it would take an hour for me to explain. But the perception versus the reality of the research is so wildly different. It's almost like we're in two entirely different universes. So if your provider tells you that vaginal breach is not safe, they have not been adequately educated. They likely don't know any of the research in the last two decades. And that's what we're here for as an organization. We're here to re-educate people. That's the short version of singleton term breaches. For preterm, again, for most preterm breaches too, the evidence is that it's pretty much just as safe too. And especially if you take into long, the account long-term outcomes for the mother and for the baby. There might be a, an advantage for these extremely premature breaches that sometimes cesarean section is better when they're teeny, teeny, teeny. But if they're small, so small that they're pre-viable, then why would you want to do a C-section? Question at the edge of viability in these first few weeks of viability, but even that is debatable. And then as for multiples, again, most providers will tell you if any of your babies are breached as twins, especially the first one, oh, you got to have a C-section. And that's actually not true. All of the best evidence coming out in the last several decades shows that no matter the presentation of the first or the second twin, a vaginal birth should be tried. That a C-section is not preferable. It doesn't give you any better outcomes. And this is so wildly different than what most people in America hear, especially if the first baby is breached, but even oftentimes if the second one is breached. So with multiples, it basically is the same thing. The babies are pretty much going to be born if you have an experienced provider and if you're patient enough. Almost all the babies are going to be born vaginally. You know, and sometimes you have in labor C sections, as you do for head down babies, but you don't need to plan a C section short of a very specific reason that you cannot go into labor and have a vaginal birth. And those reasons are very rare. So that's the summary of the evidence. If you want to get into the depths of the research, we do have some things on our website that you can look at. We have some lectures that you can download and watch for a small donation. And you can Read your fill of the literature if you're into that sort of thing. What is your website and how do we find you on Instagram? We are breachwithoutborders.org. I believe our Instagram handle is breachwithoutborders. We're also breachwithoutborders on Facebook. So we should be pretty easy to find. And we're happy to get in touch if you send us a message. We'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. I'm happy if you want to email me. I'm rixa at breachwithoutborders.org. I will do my best to respond as quickly as possible, given that I'm running this organization as a volunteer and working probably triple full time for pretty much no pay right now, especially because our teaching has slowed down. The only income that Dr. Hayes and I get is when we teach and COVID has really shut our teaching down. And it's, um, it's slow, but it's coming back. So I'm doing my best given that we have a very limited amount of resources and budget right now, but we're hoping to change that. So be patient with me. I will try to respond. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. Dr. Freeze, if anyone is listening today and they are have found out or, you know, approaching their, their breach birth or their breach presentation right now, what resources or advice do you have for those parents? First off, spend some time on our website. Again, it's breachwithoutborders.org. We have so many amazing free resources on the website. We have breach birth videos, we have infographics, we have statistics, we have illustrations, we have explanations of what things look like, how it works. If you want to get more in depth and really know all this information, you can take our class that's tailored specifically for parents or doulas or childbirth educators. It's called Breach 101. And it's about half the content of our full breach workshop that we teach to healthcare professionals. 
So we don't give you the hands-on clinical training. Like we don't train you how to do the maneuvers and how to actually attend the birth, but you get all of the other information with the warning that I'm an academic, my apologies. So it gets, it does get detailed. You're getting the, actually a lot of the same lectures that the healthcare professionals are getting. It might be a little bit much for some people. That's kind of my style. So you have to be patient with the fact that I'm kind of a nerd with breach and I like to give all the information possible. So it's very thorough, but I think you'd really enjoy it if, if you're a parent or a doula or an educator and you'll come away knowing so much about breach. You'll probably be going back to your doctor or your midwife and going, hey, did you know there's several kinds of breach presentations that are mislabeled? And hey, did you know here's the average perinatal mortality? And you can just educate them. <laughs> and you, you, know, you could have many, many long conversations with your providers after having taken our Breach 101 course. So that's a great resource for people who don't necessarily need the hands-on training, but want a lot of the information. Okay. Thank you, guys for being on the podcast today. Before I close, I mean, my plat- I always say my platform is your platform. Like I do this so that you guys can share your voice. So before we close, have you guys covered everything that's on your heart and your mind that you want to put out there to my little 100,000 subscribers, <laughs> so, yeah. whoever they may be? There's a couple of things that I would, I would plug in at the end here. I think that one, um, um, back to the question of safety, which I didn't really talk about, it's sort of disingenuous to look at the outcomes of one pregnancy and one birth and have that be your standard. And Rix has sort of alluded to this, but didn't really go into it. The fact of the matter is, yes, if, if doing a lot of C-sections saves a certain number of babies, in the primary birth, there is lots of evidence that you lose that number of babies in subsequent births because of the C-section in the first birth. There's also a much, much higher maternal mortality rate in subsequent pregnancies because of the C-section in that first birth. So those are things that we can't leave out of this conversation. When you're providing informed consent counseling to a woman, you are obligated to take into account not just the pregnancy she has, but her reproductive plans and her potential entire reproductive life. You don't want to do a C-section on someone for a breach who's planning to have seven more babies. That's just another piece to add to the, to the, the safety discussion. I think secondly, the fact that breach birth skills have largely disappeared in the obstetric community does offer us a little bit of a silver lining. And that is the way breach was being taught to those people back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s is very different from the current state of the research and what is being taught now, which is physiologic upright breach. And the outcomes, there's really good evidence that the outcomes are much better. So, you know, the silver lining here would be, yes, breach skills have gone away and obstetricians have been de-skilled, but we can bring it back with much better skills now. We are in a position to do that. So there's that physiologic, and there's that, that, that silver lining. Can I ask, David, what advice you would give to, especially to people who are working within the hospital system, given that there's so much to negotiate between peer pressure and hospital administrator pressure and sanctions they might face for supporting autonomy and breach births? How do we navigate this? I wish I had a good answer to that question, Rick. So I, I don't. It is, I mean, I understand the peer pressure. I have seen many, many, many very well intentioned. I have had people who I did their home births for their babies, and they subsequently were inspired to go to medical school and become obstetricians and f- get themselves in the hospital, continue having their own babies at home, but be under the pressure, under the peer pressure of their hospitals will not do those same things and offer those same things to their own clients. And, and I know these people and I know where their hearts are, but I also know the pressure that they're facing. 
and it is tremendous. Hospitals and medical boards and medical societies will literally take your livelihood away and put you out of business. And it happens every day in virtually every hospital in this country. I I wish I had a good answer to that question. I don't. But understand that your doctor, well, depending on how you look at it, is under a tremendous amount of pressure and may, in fact, be sympathetic with what you want. But the flip side of that is obviously doesn't have the courage of their convictions. So Well said. Scary. It reinforces how important it is that people giving birth make their voices loud and clear. Mm -hmm. You know, it needs to come en masse from pregnant women because they ultimately wield the power. If if they're willing to speak up enough and if enough people speak up over and over again. I know it sounds really like hallelujah, idealistic, you know, let's all sing and hold hands, but that's how it's going to have to change is con- consumer pressure. Absolutely. And we believe we believe that can happen. I mean, to, to let me to be to be clear, we we are getting buy-ins from hospital-based midwives. We are getting buy-ins from some obstetricians. We are even getting buy-ins from some hospitals. It's happening. It's happening mm-hmm. slowly, too slowly for our taste, but we've only been at this since August of 2019, and you know we're already seeing it happen. So i actually cautiously optimistic, and that's not my nature. Dr. Freeze and Dr. Hayes, thank you so much for being on the Birth Story podcast today and for inspiring and empowering all of our listeners, and hopefully many of them are providers that will seek out education and change within their systems that will be open to doing home births as well. And for all of the clients and the consumers out there for encouraging them to get educated as well and use their voice and speak up and out against these systems so that we can trust their body, their baby, and their womb space in which the decision has been made on how their body and their baby need to most safely birth. So thank you for being on today. Thank you very much for having us. And thank you for um, all you do in broadcasting our message. After we finished recording, Dr. Freeze and Dr. Hayes and I continued our conversation. And so we just want to leave you with a little bit more that we didn't include in the first recording. And that is about what is going on in our world today, specifically to in the United States with persons of color, women of color that are birthing racial hate and how women have been raised to be quiet, to not speak up, to not advocate for ourselves, and that there is this dirty little secret going around that like we can't do it, that we're not strong. And so the podcast that we just recorded that you heard was about empowerment and about education and about speaking up. And so I want you to hear from Dr. Hayes and Dr. Freeze one last time on their commitment and their dedication to helping serve minorities. And so could you share with us a little bit about what you just told me? There is well-documented, there are racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic and background disparities between in outcomes. And it is also well-documented that those disparities diminish when the birth attendant is from the same racial, ethnic, cultural background as the people that they're serving. And to that end, we at Reach Without Borders have have a pretty active scholarship program ongoing to provide free training for birth attendants, birth doulas, midwives, I guess even obstetricians of color from those backgrounds, migrant, Native American, Asian Pacific, Black, to in order to have to give them access to our training for use in their community. Like I said, the data is very clear. The outcomes are better when you do that. And so we're trying, trying very hard to support that. We're actually applying for a number of grants nationwide to, to fund that effort as well. Yeah, so we have more information on our grant projects on our website. If you go to our grants tab, you can find out about our vision for how we're trying to train the providers and the communities that need it the most. 
let's say you're your average pregnant woman, your baby's head down, you probably haven't really worried about breach because your baby's not breach. So why is that important to you? And I would say it's important because if hospitals and providers are willing to sacrifice your body upon the altar of their fear and their ignorance and force you to have surgery that you might not need or want, that might make it more dangerous for you for the rest of your life, then you might be vulnerable to those assaults upon your autonomy for other things besides breach. So breach is probably the most vulnerable, but it won't stop at breach. I mean, we've seen it happening with access to VBAC, access to vaginal twins, access to home birth because of restrictive regulations. So I would say if you care about bodily autonomy and you want choice, even if maybe you wouldn't choose that personally, but you care enough that you wouldn't want anybody to have to be forced to have surgery, it hopefully should matter to you, even if your baby isn't breech, but because it is a litmus test for how willing a system is to support maternal autonomy, which again is ensconced in our laws and in all of our medical ethics. Yet we're breaking those laws and those ethics every day because of fear and ignorance and lack of training. So practical suggestions, if you're a pregnant woman, if you're a midwife, if you're a doula, incessant calls and letter writing to hospital administrators and to your care providers saying, I want vaginal breach options. I want VBAC options. I want water birth options. I want this. I want this. What are you going to do to support this? How are you going to make sure that you're not going to violate my bodily autonomy if this thing happens to me? And if they hear it enough times from enough women, it's going to start raising some flags in their mind. And they're going to say, something's happening. We got to get on top of this. Why are all these women demanding options? We better do something about it. So if you're a midwife, have every one of your clients write at least once or twice during their pregnancies. I want these options. What are you going to do? How are you going to give me these options that are so important to me? If we can change the attitude and the assumptions so that autonomy is at the forefront of everybody's care, ethical treatment and, and supporting autonomy is our, are our foundational principles, then every option will be available because it would be unthinkable to force somebody, to assault somebody's body and force them to have a treatment that they don't want. That's the way we got to make change. So I don't care if your baby's head down. I don't care if you might not, you know, be having twins, but advocate for those options loudly and often and clearly and tell all of your friends to do so and tell all of your clients because it matters, you know, just like hopefully we'd advocate for people who are, you know, if we are white and we care about racial uh, injustice, hopefully we would advocate for that, even if it doesn't concern ourselves on a, on a personal or daily basis. It's the same. You know, hopefully we have the empathy and the sense of community that we care about other people's suffering and other people's lack of rights. And we want to do something about it. So write those letters, make those phone calls, be the persistent, annoying person who keeps doing this and gets all of her friends and all of her coworkers and just keep going at it until all of a sudden they just can't stand all the mail they're getting and they say, okay, fine, we'll do this thing for you. And tag them on social media because they hate that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that perspective, Dr. Fries and Dr. Hayes. I'm really glad that we jumped right back on to re-record that segment. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the